at some juncture. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are now live. Hello and good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Ohio is <laughs> that's Japanese. Um, my name is Ruben Ariz Mindy. I'm an attorney in San Diego. I've been practicing for 30 years. My practice focuses on living trusts, on uh, bankruptcies, which is kind of uh, ironic. Either you're doing very well and you need to protect your assets or things have turned bad because of COVID maybe, and you may find yourself in need of a bankruptcy. Just uh, before we get into our talk with our, our uh, exceptional speaker, uh, guest speaker, um, I want to tell you just a little bit about um, living trust, the ups and downs. The real huge thing here is that people do living trust um, to avoid probate. And so we, you, you're dealing with two different concepts here. What the heck is a living trust and what the heck is probate? Well, the living trust is, is really a package of documents that include powers of attorney, include uh, health care directives, and the two most uh, important operative documents are a declaration of trust. That's where you put down what you would like to see happen in the event you uh, pass away. You, your spouse, uh, you pass away, and now what do you do with the assets that you have? Uh, what, you know, what happens with those assets? Well, if you don't have a living trust, you're forced to go to court, and the court proceeding is called a probate court. Uh, a probate proceeding. You want to eliminate that by filing a, by uh, preparing and drafting through an attorney um, your living trust package, precisely so that your assets go where you want them to go. And ideally, if you have family and that's where you want them to go, that family saves thousands and thousands of dollars by making sure that uh, they are not stuck in court working out their problems and transferring assets to their children. It is, um, it is a very specialized area of law, has a lot of different uh, aspects and components to it that uh, really require you to have an attorney involved in that. Uh, missing that, uh, you're going to be forced into court and, you're going to, and it's gonna cost your children, your heirs, um, a lot of money, a lot more money than, than it would have had you done a living trust package. Um, it is something that's much better than a will. The living trust declaration and the um, pour over will, essentially what a pour over will does is it says today, oops, technical difficulties. <laughs> today I am uh, I, I'm doing my trust and my will, and I will get the lottery tomorrow, and that those lottery proceeds simply pour over into the trust for distribution the way I want it to be distributed. Okay, that's all I'm gonna do on my soapbox. Uh, soapbox. <coughs> Excuse me. And what I wanna do is introduce our, our very distinguished uh, guest and friend of mine, um, let me give you a little background on him. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm reading <laughs> Crimmigration Attorney John R. Rod R. Rodriguez um, has dedicated 23 years protecting the civil rights of non citizens faced with criminal charges and immigration penalties that, that threaten the long time, their long time ties to the United States and their ability to become a lawful resident or US citizen. John has been the chair of the uh, San Diego Immigration Section, uh, the president of, San of La Raza Lawyers Association. He's a professor at, uh, of legal studies at National University. And he's also a member of the American Immigration Lawyer Association, which is really one of the most important associations that every attorney who practices immigration law has to be a part of. Um, John Rodriguez uh, will talk today about the increasing role and the growing impact that immigration lawyers uh, play or laws play in the lives of millions of immigrants and their families. There's a, uh, it's, it's, as the title suggests here, there's a merging of criminal law and immigration law. And um, John will address how these things come up. 
And let me tell you a little bit about John in the sense that uh, John was looking a few years back for some office space uh, here in San Diego. He's from Northern, Cal uh, Northern California area, and he wanted to set up a, a really nice practice here in the Mission Valley area. Uh, it's We're centrally located. Both he and I are in both in an area of, of San Diego County that's very, very centrally located and very convenient for people from all parts of the county. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I need some water. Okay, well, John met, uh, came here. I was renting out some office space. He took a look at it. We had a conversation. Uh, we hit it off really well with his paralegal who happened to be a former student of mine. And I was uh, very pleased to see her again. Um, we, we have, maintain some really good ties. Uh, he's a good man. He's uh, uh, very helpful, help, very helpful for immigrants. And uh, he's good at giving uh, some good advice on immigration laws and on criminal laws. Those are his practice, primary practice areas. And I'm without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to him. I'm going to ask him a question right off the bat. Um, so he's going to just say hello and, and roll right into the answer very likely. So, John, I've been hearing in the news, nothing real specific, but uh, I've been hearing the news that this is an up and coming practice area where it's just that it just so happens that there's so many immigrants that tend to fall into problems. They, they don't do it intentionally for the most part, but they have uh, criminal law problems. And uh, could you probably share, could you possibly share with us what has been your experience in this area? Yeah, well, good morning and good morning to those who have joined us so far this morning. I'm looking forward to, to more people joining us uh, and perhaps participate by asking questions that may be important or relevant to their lives and their families. Um, I was fortunate that I, I began this, my practice uh, as you said earlier, up in Northern California, you do remind me of a, of a moment uh, when I ended up getting married. Um, my wife didn't want to move to the, the, the Bay Area uh, where I had been living. So I ended up moving to her uh, further north. And I was a little nervous because the population was, it was small and very few Latinos up there. And I was really concerned that I would be working in an area with few Latinos, not much of a market that I can target as a Latino myself. Well, fortunately, it turned out to be I was like the only private Latino lawyer for like 10 years up in uh, Solano County, Napa County, Yolo area. So I was a, a success overnight, so to speak. What that did though, it introduced me immediately to the issues that immigrants have if they get in trouble with the law. Some of the offenses were serious and some of them not so serious. Things that, that US citizens take for granted, an immigrant cannot take for granted. So as I struggled to represent um, non-citizens from any country, although the majority of them were from Latin America, Mexico, South America. Um, I started to learn the complexities and just how hard it is to represent an immigrant. Uh, something as simple as one day extra in a jail sentence can mean the difference between coming home and getting back to work or going straight from criminal court to immigration court for deportation. So immediately the, uh, the seriousness uh, became very vivid to me. And uh, over the years, I've learned to master the art of aggressive negotiation uh, when my client happens to be an immigrant. Yeah, aggressive but... immigration, uh, aggressive uh, negotiation. Um, so is it fair to say that um, many of these cases, many of these scenarios, you're looking to get a, the best solution without having to actually take it through a court proceeding of some sort? You know, um, the, uh, the politics behind immigration um, has always complicated everything. Uh, I would even imagine in your field, 
um, we, we haven't really talked about it, but um, there are it, very successful immigrants, uh, whole, uh, permanent residents, people that have a home, they have a family, long ties here. Some have a business um, um, heavily invested and one little, even if it's a little misdemeanor, depending on what that misdemeanor is, all, that whole life of building a foundation and a family can be turned over in a flash. So it's, it's, it is very difficult um, to represent them. Sometimes the politics makes it so hard that I have no choice but to go to trial, even when I should not be going to trial. I've had so many trials in my career that uh, if it had been a US citizen that I was representing, we never would have gone to trial. But what happens is sometimes the prosecutors uh, will say, well, I'm not gonna give this guy an extra benefit just because he's not a lawful citizen um, or because he's got a green card. And so out of necessity, I've been forced to go to trial when I, even with a bad case. But fortunately, <laughs> I've developed a skill set not needed to steal cases away from the prosecutor. And I've won many, many cases that should have been lost and saved uh, many good people who happen to get in trouble. What kind of trouble are we talking about, John? I mean, can you tell us, share with us? Obviously, you can't share with us anything confidential, but you can tell us in general the type of uh, problems that uh, some immigrants run into. Well, even something as little as a DUI, which we all take for granted. You know, we go to, let's say a Christmas party, uh, Thanksgiving, we have a little too much wine. We're not, we don't feel drunk. We don't feel like we can't drive. So we get in the car, we get pulled over. And, but our, the legal limit is not very high. It's 0.08, uh, at least in California. And that in itself can trigger an issue. Now, fortunately, um, a green card holder is not going to get deported for one DUI, but the the shifting in political views uh, in a, that we have, especially under the Trump administration, has made it even even more and more difficult to represent someone, even with a single DUI. Uh, our Attorney General Barr has recently uh, created new policy, and and. An immigrant that may has two DUIs, say within a 10 year period, is suddenly potentially deportable. He certainly cannot apply to become a citizen um, if he has a second DUI. Something that simple uh, can really affect. And these are, these are new, essentially new laws or policies implemented under the Trump administration. Is that what's happening? There's been a lot of uh, shifting of, of the laws. Um, there's, you know, there's actually more focus on the enforcement of immigrant laws than there are the processing of applications. As you know, we've gone through the COVID-19, uh, we're going through the COVID-19 problems. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, a backlog of new applications. Uh, there's even a threat of, of many of the uh, USCIS employees being furloughed. And so a lot of these applications are just being on, a, they're just on a desk, not being processed. While immigrants are waiting and waiting, immigrants that have earned the right to apply are, are sitting there waiting. And a, a lot of times some of their, um, the green card will expire while they're waiting. Um, oh, wow. Certain things are no, are no longer valid. They overstay a visa that they came in on, and they're they're frightened. They're frightened to get pulled over by immigration. Some of them are faced with uh, possible removal. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Um, there was a thought that just crossed my mind when you first mentioned uh, 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 Attorney General Barr. Uh, this guy seems to be acting a little bit like the president's personal attorney, and we're not going to we're not designed to get into politics today. But the president seems to have this agenda, as a certain anti-immigrant agenda, and uh, in his attorney general seems to be backing him almost every step of the way. Um, these are things that uh, that uh, seriously impact uh, immigrants that. Uh, 
we're facing today. Is, is that correct? Yes, the world that I operate under, um, um, I, I work in two courts, uh, the Superior Court, which is a criminal, in the criminal section of, of the Superior Court. And I also go to Immigration Court. And there is a, an overlap between the two because when one happens, it also has an effect on another. Uh, so what I am noticing is policies are, are being changed under this administration we have today. Uh, and some people may think it's for the best and others will think it's not, but policies are definitely shifting, making it harder and harder for people to remain uh, here even as uh, green, green card holders. For example, uh, half of the people that hire me are people who have been long-term lawful permanent residences, but something happens along the way. Maybe when they were younger, they got arrested for fighting, for vandalism. Uh, uh, they got into an argument maybe when they first got married in, with their new spouse. You know that first couple of years of being married? It's, it's kind of tense moments where you're, you're trying to adjust to each other. Um, and some people get into a fight and they get, they, the police come and arrest somebody. We have a domestic violence scenario, right? Domestic violence is uh, poison to an immigrant. It's a deportable offense. It could just be a scratch. It, it doesn't, I, we're not talking about serious domestic violence here. Uh, I'm not trying to justify that, mm -hmm. but a push, a shove, pleading guilty to something as simple as a push, just the number of the code section itself. It doesn't matter how minor the indiscretion was. It is deportable. And all of a sudden this man with children, a, a house, a mortgage, a career is suddenly uh, threatened to lose all that. You know, that, what you just said, uh brings up uh, my recollection that there are a lot of immigrants, like I said earlier, who do seem to have acquired assets like houses and businesses. And the question is, uh, what if you have a business that you established either as an investor or somebody who, who just happened to be at the right place at the right time with the right amount of money, and you set up a really good successful business, and now you have a criminal charge that's threatening your your right to be here in the United States more than any other scenario. Uh, what, uh, what have, you, have you seen those type of cases? Those are the kind of cases that a lot of times the legal strategy is simply to fight it tooth and nail. And that's when I oftentimes end up in a jury trial. Um, I, I've known you for a few years. I kind of wish I've known you longer and even today, as I speak to you, and I was listening to your opening dialogue, I realized that there is something that I've been missing. I haven't looked at the possibility of sending a client to someone like you, because some of my clients do have money. Um, I am remembering a young woman who came from, um, she went from China to Germany, opened up a, a very successful restaurant in Germany. She decided to invest here. She spent over $300,000 on an investor's visa to open up a restaurant in San Diego. She didn't know the law uh, related to workers' comp uh, labor laws. So she violated a number of these municipal codes and some of these other administrative codes. And the district attorney filed charges against her for violating these codes. Uh, these were serious they weren't serious from a standpoint of, um, you know, it's not like she shot somebody or, or stabbed somebody, but they were serious in the sense that she violated administrative codes like workers' comp. Um, for example, she didn't know, because in her country, uh, that keeping the tip of the uh, server is illegal here. So she mm -hmm. violated that code. We went to trial. She, she could not plead to that. We were forced to go to trial. And at the end of that trial, she lost some of, the, some of those cases and she ended up getting deported and all that money, all that investment is out the window. It, somebody like her, who knows about someone like you could make arrangements. They could work on these living trusts uh, and work on protecting assets. Uh, I do know of other people who've been deported that left behind restaurants. And yeah. 
remember a young lady who was in my office crying. She owned two, um, I don't, you know, the salons for women who they do facials and, you know, hair and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she ended up uh, <laughs> making some mistakes on the application. They accused her of misrepresentation. She was in here crying and crying. She had invested a lot of money. She was making millions of dollars a year. And now she's faced with deportation, not knowing what to do. Yeah. Yeah, if I can interject here, John, <clears throat> there is a solution. Uh, if these people were to set up their trust, were to set up a limited liability company or an S corporation, um, they can uh, put somebody that they trust or, or somebody who can be bonded, somebody who can be uh, in a scenario where that person simply takes over their business for them because the penalties that I think you're describing uh, do not result in confiscation of her business. She just simply loses it, right? Uh, so, um, and rather than losing it, you come to talk to, be, to me or somebody like me, we set up a corporation, we set up a limited liability company. We assure that that business is allowed to go forward. There are profits that are being made and this person doesn't have to be deported out of this country without any, and then losing everything that uh, she has put into it. But you're absolutely right. That is something that uh, uh, as attorneys, we need to sometimes look at, ooh, that's immigration, that's criminal law. I, well, I need to get you to the right person. And, uh, and I, I don't practice immigration law. I don't practice criminal law. And I, the first thought that crossed my mind when I see that scenario is John Rodriguez. <laughs> you know, they, uh, he's well, the guy who has them both. He has them both, you know. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about immigration crim law. Is it uh, something that's relatively new, as I said earlier? Is it um, something you know, that... Um, unfortunately, um, because of the, the politics involved in, in immigration law, um, for many years now, uh, our, our government has been using criminal law as a way to try and, and like, a, like a net, drag in immigrants for removal. I started way back, long before you and I became attorneys. So even in the 50s, they were, they were finding ways to uh, arrest and deport uh, immigrants from, well, even for go, going further back, Chinese people forever suffered. We have case law today that was created because of the, the massive incarceration and, and deportation of Chinese people um, that helps us fight today. Um, of course, you've heard even way back during the war, the war when Japanese people were being put in concentration camps. Uh, on yeah, the World War II era where, where yeah. Japan attacks Pearl Harbor and all of a sudden everybody who's got any Japanese blood is a, is a traitor to this country and then they set up these concentration camps. One of the, the grossest injustice, injustices that have occurred in this country. Well, what I'm seeing today in places um, like Arizona, for example, um, and to some extent in some local municipal cities in California, um, they're turning local police officers, law enforcement into immigration officers. There are actual policies uh, right now, new policies that actually will yank federal funds away from a local agency like here in San Diego, if, they're, if they consider them a sanctuary city, or if they're not detaining and notifying immigration of immigrants that are in local custody based on some traffic violation or some, some misdemeanor arrest. Uh, so the, the punishment to the local jurisdiction is to yank federal funds away. Uh, so but by doing that, they, they force these local police agencies to go out in the street and stay alert and arrest people and notify immigration. Um, so but we're I, seeing an increase in that type of enforcement yeah, right. I thought there were laws in place that, uh, you know, I think San Diego is a sanctuary city, right, or not? Not necessarily, no. San Francisco, for sure, not San Diego. We're kind of a hybrid down here. Uh, uh, there are notifications to immigration uh, here, um, to immigration. By, by the local police? Yes, by the sheriff, 
Yes. I'm so sure. what what's happening right now is um, also the increase of notices are are going up. So if if an immigrant on their own without any review or supervision by a lawyer uh, decides to save money and submit their own application to become a citizen. I'm noticing about half of the clients that hire me are those people who submitted their own application to save money, but they did something wrong in the application. And then they be, they're accused of misrepresentation or there's something in their past that they didn't think was a problem, but immigration does. Okay. And so they send them this notice to appear before an immigration judge for removal. I don't mean to cut you off, John, but this misrepresentation that you're referencing, that's a crime in itself, right? That's, uh, that's, what, that's the way um, immigration courts look at it as a crime, right? The type of misrepresentation I'm talking about is not so much a statutory crime that oh. the state of California will prosecute you for. These are allegations of misrepresentation for saying something wrong on an application, right? Um, and I, I don't mean to minimalize this. Uh, some of these are serious. I do get my share of gross misrepresentations uh, where they claim to have, let's say for example, they claim to be unmarried at the time that the parent is petitioning them, but they, were, but they in fact were married. That's a more serious misrepresentation. Um, or they have claimed uh, in an application- But that's also a crime, that, isn't it, John? Isn't no, that bigamy? Oftentimes, these are not criminal prosecutions. Uh -huh. um, so I'm seeing an increase in, in that. Uh, it used to be, to, to be honest, um, if, if USCIS denies your application, they don't automatically send you a notice to go before an immigration judge for deportation. But that's a policy that's new that now occurs with much more frequency today, these notices to appear. And they're fast tracking a lot of these deportations. There's this thing called expedited removal. It's a shortcut to deportation where the person doesn't have a right to even go before a judge to present their case. There's an increase in that. And the horrible thing about that type of deportation, there's no, uh, no constitutional right to protect them. I can't file an appeal. I can't go before a judge to try and review what really happened during that contact. There, there's no, I think it's referred to as an administrative uh, appeal or something like that. Or? There is, it's it's not, um, first of all, there is no appeal to that type of process. A yeah. lot of times this happens at the border, but uh, our president has expanded that policy um, to go miles into the, into the United States. It used to be at the border. Now it, it can happen just about anywhere. Um, depending on, on the situation that occurs during the contact. But a lot of times the traditional expedited removal, they're at the border trying to cross over with a fake card. In Mexico, they'll buy them. It's a fake card. They just buy a fake card for a little bit of money and they hope that it works to get in instead of trying to go over the mountains, which is real dangerous. A lot of times mothers will try to cross with their children with some purchase of a card. That, that's a misrepresentation. So instead of saying you got to go back, no, it's a voluntary return. They label it expedited removal. It's in, a, in a essence, it's a deportation, which will affect for life, their ability to get a green card in the future or a tourist visa. So it, it, it affect, it's essentially a, a deportation the way any other deportation is a deportation. Yeah, it's, it's, a, short, it's a short expedited removal. Okay, and, and what, uh, what does that create? It creates a situation where they can never come back into the States or what? Legally, as of today, yes, you're right. As of today, unfortunately, and I have a, a, a just yesterday, it was a sad situation. I, um, I had a situation where the person has an expedited removal in their information that I received and I'm looking at it, trying to figure out what can we do for this person? The person's been here a long time. I have another client the same way. She's married to a U.S. citizen. She's got a, a children now. Uh, she actually came here. Uh, she's from El Salvador. So she came here on, under protective status, which by the way, under our new administration, they, they terminated that just recently, uh, just a few months ago or a couple of months ago, they terminated protective status. So she no longer has the protection of protective status. 
many, many years ago when she was young, she was caught at the border trying to come in with her two children. Her two children were here. They made it across, but she didn't. And so she lied and said she's from Mexico, not from El Salvador. They caught her in the lie. So they gave her an expedited removal label. Mm. So she can't legally come back here. Ever. And there's nothing I can do to fix it. No, I've tried. I've, I've done my homework. Can't find mm. anything to fix that but, problem for her. But there are other scenarios where, where people can come back into the country after a 10-year wait and a, and a petition for a waiver. Is that correct? Uh huh. Yes. Uh, I, I often get the call by uh, an immigrant saying, "I'm I'm here because I want to know more about the ten year rule." You know? Okay. Like, yes, años, and they think that that enough years have gone by and that now they can apply. And some of them are right, some of them are not. But yes, if you've tried to, if you've lived on this side of the border, and you cross that border, even if it's voluntary, you've triggered a 10-year punishment, a 10-year bar. And so you can't really fix papers and you got to wait and do your time for 10 years. That's the general rule. There are some minor exceptions to that. And, and after the expiration of the 10 years, you still have to do uh, some type of a petition? Uh... There's, a, there's an application you're asking for permission to re-enter uh, right. if you wait 10 years. If you, if you want to try sooner, then there's... It's a, um, it's a more complicated process. Okay. Um, so as far as, uh, for those that may be watching or those that may wanna share this with immigrant family members, what's really, really important, and by the way, I know you have a time limit. What time do we end this? We're actually one minute over the, our 10.30. Oh, we're over, uh, okay. <laughs> but that's okay. I was just gonna ask you for some closing comments on, on how you can, uh, how the immigrants can protect themselves to a certain extent. They can protect themselves by immediately uh, scheduling consultation with a, with a criminal defense attorney that actually knows something about immigration law. People with a background in immigration and criminal law. Um, make sure that you look carefully and review the attorney's background. There, there are attorneys that advertise both and it's not necessarily true, or at least it's not, they don't have enough experience in one or the other to have a, 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 the best advice for you. So I have had a, a, a large percentage of cases where prior counsel was hired and said, this does not trigger any kind of an immigration problem. And they were dead wrong. Mm -hmm. Many of my cases are lawyers who were dead wrong on their advice. Quite honestly, I, I think after about 23 years, I think I found my calling today. I think all those trials that I've had, all that litigation representing immigrants in Northern California has finally put me in a place where I can truly make a difference for the immigrant who was screwed by their criminal lawyer who didn't do their homework and, pled, and thinking that just because it's a little misdemeanor that it's not going to destroy their immigration status and they're wrong. Today, many of my cases I'm going after the lawyer. I'm going after the incompetent attorney who messed up the non-citizen's life. And uh, some of these lawyers are getting to know me. I actually had one call me recently to say, John, um, I made a mistake when I pled my client guilty to this case. They told me they were gonna call you. I, I'm calling you and I hadn't even heard from their client yet. The right. lawyer is reaching out ahead of the client saying, I'm, I'm there to help him. I know I screwed up. Uh, just do me a favor and try not to get me suspended <laughs> from the bar. <laughs> wow. So, uh, you know, there's a small reputation already out there, but there are many attorneys who were taking it for granted. I made mistakes early in my career, not recognizing how some immigration policy could trigger removal because of a little mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. I've made those mistakes many years ago. I don't do them now. I right, great, great. That's good to know, John. Uh, I want to know if you can go a little bit longer with uh, any questions that may come up. If people would like to to uh, put it in a chat or or just simply unmute yourself and uh, and let us know that you have a question. 
Say uh, hi. Any questions for us? Yeah, tell us hi that you have a question. And you know, I'm looking at, I'm trying to look in the chat here and I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, maybe I should have mentioned that at the very get go that you that you can simply use your chat box to to uh, ask questions. Okay, um, what if you crossed and have been deported? What ha what can you do if you cross the border illegally and have now been deported, but you're in the United States? Is that correct, Martina? Is uh, you, but came back. Yes, that's correct. That's the question. Well, I think we addressed that a little bit earlier, but we can readdress it. Yeah, I'll expand on my uh, on based on the question. And and unfortunately, I cannot help everybody. I, I wish I had the magic fingers to help people. I that's in one of the situations that may be very difficult to help. And there are very few remedies, but the remedies are very scary. I'll give you an example of how scary the it could be most people who've been deported they come right back they have to it's their their family are here their children's are here some of them have very young children and and they're the, and the husband is the only one making money so there is no choice but to come back unfortunately and maybe maybe it's too political but uh our policies need to change to recognize that type of of an immigrant that has a a, a long ties and roots in this community. I'll avoid that. Um, that individual who comes back after a deportation is stuck. The, the law doesn't allow them to fix their papers anymore. They have to be out of the country for a minimum of 10 years if they've been living illegally in America for one year or more. The only remedy that is possibly available if it wasn't an official deportation, in other words, if it was a voluntary return only, that person <laughs> might be able to do it with a waiver, con un perdón. Um, but it depends on the facts, very fact specific. If the person is in removal proceedings, there is an other waiver. There is one waiver available that is only available if you're in court in front of a, of a judge wanting to deport you. It's called cancellation of removal by, a, by either a lawful resident or by non-lawful resident. But it means that you're fighting your case in trial in front of a court and you're trying to prove that there's so many positive equities in your favor that you're, that you're given, you, should, you deserve a second chance. Uh, Martina, did that help you? I hope. Um, I got another question coming in that says, do you recommend everyone to go to you to review their application to become a U.S. citizen? Uh, is, it, is that's fraught with certain uh, pitfalls if you're not if you're doing your immigration uh, application and you're and you've got something in your past that could hurt you? Isn't that correct? Especially if there's something in your past, applications can be denied just because you forgot to check a box. Uh, or there's something in the information of your N-400, the application for naturalization, that is not the same on the application that was on your adjustment of status. There's mm -hmm. an inconsistency and they'll use it either to request for further evidence to support the inconsistency or you'll get a denial uh, along with a notice to appear before a judge for removal. So yes, uh, even if it's a straightforward, you've been a good boy, you've been a good girl, there's never been a problem, no indiscretions, no violations, you never overstayed, you came with a visa. Um, under the best case, case scenarios, you should have an attorney review what you've done. And be careful going to what we call notarios, <laughs> non-lawyers uh, who, who say that they know enough to get you by. Be very careful. Yeah, these are these are people who are essentially operating, uh, practicing law without a license, and and in many cases that have it, no clue of what they're really doing, but they think they know. And so, yeah, I, I, I'll second that that emotion, so to speak. It is uh, something you have to be very extremely careful about. But you know, not only in immigration scenarios that John's describing, but anything doing your will, your trust. Uh, these notarios are 
notorious. They're do they're known for for doing things uh, shortcuts that uh, can seriously injure your uh, your path to walking a straight line and doing everything legally. I could only imagine go, uh, going to a notario to do some living trust and you won't know there's a mistake there until maybe 10 years later, years later when it gets activated. John, we got another uh, chat uh, question. Well, first of all, uh, Martina said, okay, thank you for your previous answer. But then she added, what if my coworker is from Sinaloa, Mexico, but here on a visa, probably a tourist visa is what she's referring to, had two kids while working here in the States. Uh, will she have to, let me see, will, will she have to wait uh, to her child is of age to make her a citizen? Well, she's here illegally from this scenario. Yeah, well, it's, if somebody comes in legally, one of the benefits of, of coming in legally with, a, say, a tourist visa, it's what we call being admitted and inspected. If somebody was inspected and admitted and allowed to come in lawfully, the beauty and the benefit of that is that they can later in the future adjust within the state. They can get their green card and become permanent residents, even if they never went back. They were supposed to, right? But they didn't. Those people, if they have the proper person to petition them, can stay. So who would be a a qualifying relative if your friend is married to a US citizen or lawful permanent resident? Um, If the person has a, a, a child that's 21 years or older, if the person has a parent who's a resident or a US citizen, those are the immediate relatives. Now you have other relatives like a, a tia, an aunt or an uncle, uh, but those are not uh, considered immediate relatives. It would take too long for that type of application. Uh, she's, she's adding to her questions. First she says- I need she, to charge her. Constantly. Yeah, really. She says <laughs> a friend is here legally, but she's married uh, to a gentleman who's also here legally, but on a, a type of visa of some sort. Uh, so, so they're both uh, going to have to go through the same hoops, essentially. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I do get cases where both the couple are both here illegally and they just can't help each other, unfortunately. But if they have a, another qualifying relative like a parent or an adult child, then we can begin the process for that. All right. All right. You know what, uh, John, we usually stretch this out to about 1045. It's 1042. I don't see any other chat questions, but I do know that um, there's still people online and they're, they're still, I, I'm trying to think maybe some final words of some sort. I know you, you started down that road and we kind of interrupted ourselves. Well, but, you know, Whenever there's an immigration concern or an issue, reach out to someone. You know, I, I very, not long ago, I actually had the privilege of helping my father become a US citizen. It was the proudest moment of my life to be able to be in the position to help a family member. You know, I, I think the only reason I even became a lawyer and, uh, and to do what I do is because when I was very young, we lost my uncle, uh, I, I had family member deported. And I was confused about that. I couldn't understand that he was a good man. He was a painter. Why would they do that to him? And I swore that I would grow up and help my family. I finally got that benefit many, many, many years later. Um, and not everyone has a lawyer in the family to help, but you certainly know me and you certainly you know, have access to one Look for somebody you can trust. Fortunately, we got things like Yelp, Avo, uh, Google, that you can look up their reviews to make sure that they have good reviews. Um, but if you find yourself in trouble, especially if you're an immigrant and you have, you've been arrested for something, never take for granted the potential adverse immigration consequences. Always call a lawyer, an immigration lawyer with background to give you guidance. That's my best advice. 
And, and in closing, I would say that an, a, an immigration lawyer that, like John, who has all this criminal experience, criminal law experience also, uh, it just, you just cover both ends there. And um, that's, uh, that's the whole purpose of this, this sure. discussion here is to know I'm gonna, that- I'm gonna give an example of something that just happened yesterday. Um, my new client who just hired me a couple of weeks ago had another criminal lawyer and he was pleading him guilty to a, a DUI. He was hesitant. He decided to call me. At the end of that phone call, he fired his criminal lawyer and hired me. He's DACA. He's on DACA, meaning deferred action. So he has no status other than the protection of DACA. And if he had pled guilty to that DUI, he would lose DACA. He's, he's about 22 years old. He's not married. His parents are not lawful. He has nobody to save him. The mm -hmm. only one that can save him right now is me. And this is what I did. I contacted the district attorney who's prosecuting the case. I told her who I was and what I wanted and what I expected. She offered me, she agreed to offer me a wet reckless. It's a lower standard. It's not a DUI in the books. This man had 0.23 blood alcohol, triple the legal limit. He crashed his car. It burned up. <laughs> and there was no defenses. Yeah. You couldn't avoid saying he wasn't the driver. And yet I got him a tiny little conviction that's not going to have any immigration consequences on DACA. And that's the difference between somebody who specializes in this, somebody who's just, say, a criminal lawyer. So that, that's important because other people like me can do the same thing for immigrants who make a boo-boo. <laughs> okay. John, it's been a, a real pleasure because, you know, our friendship and, and our back, our history of uh, doing good things for the Latino community and every community that comes before us that uh, has uh, legal needs, you know, it's giving back, giving back to the community in one way. And uh, I really, really am very pleased with all this information that you've imported to us today. Uh, people who are online, people who will be seeing this either on their Facebook or their, um, they can see it on YouTube, it's gonna go there. And, uh, you know, if you who are here with us today know of somebody who is interested in, uh, in these type of issues, by all means, contact John on the criminal law and immigration law scenario. And don't hesitate to call me too, if you have somebody that you know who may be subject to deportation and has a business or has assets here that they're risk, at risk of losing. Uh, John and I are very keen to that now. We're now that we've had this conversation and we're gonna do the best we can to, to look after uh, the best interests of uh, these people who are in that situation. John, thank you very much. Have a great day, the rest thank of your day. Everybody, thank, you, thank you for, for the visitors. <laughs> yes, thank you. Take care.